Hello and welcome back to Kinky History, the podcast where we discuss all the dirty little secrets they probably left out of your history books. I am your host, Esme Louise James, and today we are talking about the history of oral sex. Now, it may shock you to know that oral sex is actually on the rise at the moment. We have had some national studies come out from the USA, the UK, Germany, Japan, Australia, and these studies all show that there is a current decline in more traditional hanky-panky, and we are all turning instead to oral stimulation. And this isn't just the older generation uh, not having the energy to participate in normal hanky-panky anymore. In fact, the biggest decrease was seen among adolescents uh, between the ages of 14 to 25. Now, this generation has seen a striking near 50% cutback in more more traditional partnered activity. And instead, we have seen a 15% rise in oral sex. So where did this sudden lingus loving come from? Now, where did this sudden lingus loving come from? Well, throughout history, we have had a very rich and ever-changing relationship to our perception of oral sex. It was only recently, about 100 years ago, for example, that we considered oral sex to be associated with the lower class. It was something that uh, poorly educated people would participate in and very much associated with a working class. However, in recent statistics, we've seen that there's actually a, a bit of an increase in slurp in the gherkin among those with a higher level of education. They tend to be the ones engaging more in oral sex than people with a lower level of education. Now, in one of our own surveys that uh, my mum and myself put out last year, we found that people were actually uh, more interested in participating in a bit of uh, culinary delight than they were sex. Now, these numbers shocked me, and I am not a numbers person, but last year, in the near 20,000 people that we surveyed, 86% of them had enjoyed a little kiss down under, whereas only 81% had done it the old-fashioned way. Now, of course, oral sex can be considered more of a foreplay activity. It can be seen as a stepping stone on the way to the final big bang. However, something like these stats show that it actually has more of a hold on us at this current moment than perhaps ever in history of our recorded national statistics. So to really understand the role that uh, oral sex plays in our life today, I think it's about time that we dive in and do a little oral history of this sex act. So it seems that oral sex is actually becoming more popular than people doing it the traditional way. And by that, I mean the traditional way as it's defined on old surveys, a very heteronormative penis in vagina kind of scenario. Now to really start our... uh, Now, to really start our history of this culinary delight, I am going to take you back all the way to the ancient world, where all of our histories seem to begin. (laughs) Now, this time we are starting with ancient Egypt. Um, And in ancient Egyptian philosophy, my God, were these gods absolutely horny. These gods are going at it any which way. Um, And in the mythology of the creation of Earth, we actually have some of the earliest depictions of oral sex. Now, the creation of the world in Egyptian mythology all starts with the god Atom, who literally wanks the world into existence. And from his godly cubby custard, we get the air god and the moisture god. Now, these two uh, offspring with nothing else and no one else to love obviously turn to incest. And from there, they make the god of the sky and the god of the earth. These two uh, grandchildren very much take after their parents and uh, get it on Game of Thrones style with one another. In fact, the god of the earth and the god of the sky fuck so often and so frequently that old Gramps has to come around and physically separate the two, which is how we get uh, (laughs) the sky and the earth. 
Now, Geb, the uh, the god of the earth, is very unsatisfied with uh, with being separated from his sister, and so he does as uh, many men today wish they could do, and bends over himself and starts to suck his own cock. There is an absolutely brilliant uh, hieroglyphic that depicts. <laughs> Geb like rolled over himself with his cock in his mouth and it's like a very serious uh, illustration and honestly I want it tattooed onto my body but as far as I know that's the oldest illustration of uh, well maybe ever of someone sucking their own cock so shout out Geb uh, love your work Now, while Geb's on the earth uh, having a little self-pleasure yoga fun, his sister has fallen pregnant from all of their incestuous activity. And from her pregnancy, she produces three children in particular importance to this story. And that is Osiris, Isis, and Set. Now, Osiris and Isis continue the family tradition and uh, get married and fall in love. And Set, for various reasons, is insanely jealous of his brother, mainly because he married the sister that he also wanted to fuck. But Set, in all of his jealousy, decides to try and uh, knock off his brother. He devises a series of ways to try and murder Osiris, And finally, he does it Dexter style. He chops him up into little pieces of sashimi and feeds him to the fishes. Now Isis, quite understandably, is a little bit annoyed that her husband has been chopped up and made into fish food. And so she decides that she will try and put him back together again. Shout out Humpty Dumpty. She goes and finds all of the various parts of his body. However, there is one part that she fails to find because it has been consumed by the fishes. And that is his penis. Luckily, Isis is a very DIY kind of lady and uh, she manages to forge him an artificial penis from the earth. With her artificial dildo style penis in hand, uh, she puts the final part back onto her husband and literally blows him back to life. Isis manages to give him literally the best blowjob of his entire life and briefly brings him back into the world of the living. This allows the happy couple to fuck one more time and produce their offspring, Horus. I told you, these gods, so horny. (laughs) The literal origins of this world, sex and oral sex. Osiris now says goodbye to the world of the living and quite literally ghosts his wife. Now their song Horus, however, would now go on to write his own account into the history of oral sex. Their posthumously conceived son uh, grows up ready to get revenge on his uncle for chopping off the patriarchal penis. And so Horus and Set nephew and uncle would engage in a series of battles for the throne known as the contendings of Horus and Set. Now without a king to the throne anymore after the death of Horus's dad, Horus and Set are left to battle it out for the throne. Nephew and uncle go head to head in a series of trials to find out who is deemed worthy to be the next king. And as we should not be surprised by this stage, a lot of them have to do with semen and oral sex. Now, while many of these trials are fairly boring um, on the scale of, you know, Harry Potter wizarding trials, I don't know if these ones would really pass the mark. Um, They engage in such thrilling trials as trying to hold their breath underwater for the longest period of time. However, in one that is a little bit more dubious and very hashtag no homo, uh, Set decides to creep in to the bed of his nephew. Now, in an act of sabotage and also hashtag no homo, the uncle Set uh, creeps into his nephew's bed in a way to try and emasculate him. See, 
in ancient Egypt, it was considered incredibly degrading to have the uh, semen of another man upon you. This was considered completely emasculating. And this is the way that Set tries to sabotage his nephew so he cannot claim the throne. This is a reading that we have from one of the accounts of this story. Now afterward, at evening time, bed was prepared for them, and they both lay down. But during the night, Set caused his phallus to become stiff and inserted it between Horace's thighs. Then Horace placed his hands between his thighs and received Set's semen. Horace went to tell his mother, Isis, help me, Isis, my mother, come and see what Set has done to me. And he opened his hands and let her see Set's semen. She let out a loud shriek, caused the copper knife. Oh, sorry. She let out a loud shriek, seized the copper knife and cut off his hands that were equivalent. Then she fetched some fragrant ointment and applied it to Horace's phallus. She caused it to become stiff and inserted it into a pot. And he caused his semen to flow down from it. Ancient Egyptian mythology, absolutely PG. So what's basically happened in this moment is that uh, Horace's mum has seen her brother's semen all over her son's hands and in a very logical reaction decides to cut them all off. This was done, as I say, to uh, discard any proof that Horace has had the semen of another man upon him, which would have made him ineligible for the throne. Now, after milking her son's man into a pot, very problematically, um, Isis devises a little plan of her own to get revenge on Horace's uncle. She goes to his humble abode and goes into his garden. And there she sprinkles her son's cubby custard all over Set's favourite vegetable which in maybe the weirdest part of this entire story was lettuce. With his, with his prized lettuce covered in Horace's cubby custard, <laughs> Set then eats this uh, Caesar salad with a little bit too much seasoning. When they... Oh, sorry. When they come to decide who will win the throne, Set finds himself with a halo of shame around his head, basically signaling that he is not eligible because he has the semen of another man inside of him. As a fun fact, it was for this very reason that lettuce became known as a very popular aphrodisiac in the ancient world. Uh, the lettuce that would have been most common of the time was cos lettuce. And if you've ever cut a cos lettuce down the middle, you would see that it has some milky, dewy substance that comes out of it. They believe that was the come of the god. Lettuce suddenly got a whole lot better. Now, references to oral sex weren't solely limited to ancient Egypt. We have reports of different acts of loving lingus from all over the ancient world. In remaining brothel sites from ancient Rome, we can still see a lot of artwork depicting fellatio and cunnilingus at the time, especially in the sites of Pompeii. Some of these were also considered advertisements for uh, workers in these brothels who particularly excelled in these services. Erotic pottery, even depicting oral sex, has been found from ancient Peru. If you go and Google this pottery, you will find that there is plentiful depictions of oral sex and anal sex on some of their cups, pots, and artwork, and very rarely would you find depictions of penis and vagina sex. So maybe in ancient Peru, they were getting down quite similarly to we are today with heteronormative vaginal sex off the card and oral sex in. 
In ancient India, the practice of oral sex was certainly not uncommon and was mentioned in various texts. Of course, most famously, the Kama Sutra, which was a, and we'll talk about this another time on the podcast, but it was an ancient Indian text about the art of living well and also living a fulfilling, pleasurable life. In the Kama Sutra, you can find detailed instructions about how to perform fellatio and cunnilingus. Um, and the text also very much emphasized the importance of mutual pleasure for both the partner and the giver in these sexual encounters. This is very similar to the records that we have of oral sex in ancient China. And we can find very similar kind of instructive texts, uh, one such being the arts of the bedchamber, otherwise known as the Tao otherwise known as the Tao of Love. Now, this was a collection of writings on sexual practices and techniques, such as how to perform oral sex. And in the very much the same way, it also emphasized uh, the importance of making this a mutually pleasurable exchanging experience. It's probably worth noting that in ancient China, attitudes towards sexuality were often more conservative than those in ancient India. Um, and sexual pleasure was viewed as a means of kind of achieving spiritual and emotional harmony rather than just physical pleasure. Whereas in ancient Egypt, oh fuck, whereas in ancient India, um, this pleasure was actually seen as a key factor in living a very fulfilling and happy life. Going over to ancient Greece, uh, rather than having instructions, there was very strict rules on how oral sex can be performed. Now, this was very much related to their thinkings on homosexuality. It was considered shameful and degrading to be the one who performed oral sex. While there was pretty... While there was very little stigma attached to the person who actually received it. Now, it should be mentioned that while possibly the majority of these are about uh, male oral sex, there is actually a fair amount about cunnilingus for women as well, especially in the artwork that we find from ancient Rome and, you know, some from ancient Greece. Um, there are references to women performing cunnilingus on other women, men performing cunnilingus on uh, women, and the whole beautiful, diverse abode. Um, back in the ancient times, we seem to have a better understanding of oral sex in some cases than I think we do today. <laughs> I think it's interesting to see that in the ancient world, we have this recognition that sexual acts can be mutually pleasurable and between different people and different genders whereas today I know especially like when I was in my adolescence uh head was something that was very much just related to guys I remember my first kind of the first time I learned about oral sex was one of my one of my because I had many one of my high school boyfriends probably my first one um we were like you know making out or as, as the kids say hooking up and he kind of whispers to me being like um next time we do this can you give me head and I had no fucking clue what he was on about and I remember going to like a wiki how website on how to give head and it gave this like step-by-step -step instruction on how to suck off a guy which is maybe the most repulsive thing I had ever read in my entire life so I just remember like texting him on my Motorola flip phone being like thanks but no <laughs> very much no um but shout out wiki how because it did actually have some very good instructions uh that you know followed me throughout my later life about the importance of also massaging the testicles and sucking them as well so I don't know who was commissioned to write this article but you know thanks to from my 14 year old self <laughs> all right enough enough about me back to history <laughs> oh my god when we come into the 8th century early Christian thinkers very much flip the thinking of oral sex on its head. If in ancient Greece we had this perception that giving oral sex was something that was shameful, um, they believed that it was actually the receiver that was considered the most sinful. Now, 
there is a text called The Penitential of Theodore, and it advised confessors uh, about how much penance should be dished out as punishment for the various sexual sins. Now, in this account, receiving oral sex was considered even worse than engaging in bestiality. Someone who sends seed into the mouth shall do penance for seven years. This is the worst of all evils. The list of sins uh, in this account very much progressed from masturbation being the kind of least cared about but still punishable sin to sleeping together when unmarried, naughty, naughty, to adultery, bestiality, anal sex, and finally, the worst of them all, receiving oral sex and wasting your spunk into the mouth of another. This is very much related to the fact that they believed um, that sex should only be for procreation. So any behavior that resulted in the loss of willy milk was considered incredibly sinful. Doesn't quite explain why oral sex made the bottom of the list. Um, but, you know, I guess fuck a horse and you do less penance uh, by this account. So <laughs> please don't fuck a horse. Um, great. And in a moment that I'm sure that your English teacher definitely left out of the study of Shakespeare, but perhaps some very astute and sexually knowledgeable people in your class picked up on, there are countless mentions of oral sex throughout the work of Shakespeare. I think probably the most famous comes from Hamlet, where they refer to country matters. So again, we are talking, you know, female cunnilingus here, um, but it's a reference that's probably subtle enough for a lot of teachers to skip over quite quickly. Hamlet says, lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean, my head upon your lap. I, my lord. What, did you think I meant country matters? And every time I see that performed, there's very much like a wink to the audience there, which I quite like. A little cunt tree, um, which, you know, we should talk about the history of cunt one time on uh, this podcast, but a feminist turn and we will discuss it. So <laughs> please wait for cunt. Come back. You have to come back for more cunt. There's also a beautiful reference in Venus and Adonis from 1593, in which Shakespeare very poetically says, Graze on my lips, and if those hills be dry, stray lower where the pleasant fountain lies. I think what's quite interesting is that across the work of Shakespeare, when oral sex is generally referred to, it's mainly oral sex performed on women. And Hathaway, you are a very lucky woman. Um, but in nearly all of the other accounts, it's about tongue <laughs> going inside. So not normally something that you do um, when performing oral sex on a man, at least not by what Wiki How taught me. Uh, here's another one from Taming of the Shrew. What, with my tongue in your tail? Nay, come again, good Kate. I am a gentleman. From two gentlemen of Verona? That man hath a tongue, I say, is no man. If with his tongue he cannot win a woman. Honestly, I don't know who these two gentlemen are from Verona, but they can uh, very much uh, <laughs> try that on me if they like. <laughs> but then again, we do also have some very clear references to cunnilingus. We do have some very clear references to oral sex performed on man, even references to the fact that using your teeth is very much a no-go. Another reference from Two Gentlemen of Verona. Well, the best is she who have no teeth to bite. So the dangers of teeth and oral sex are all the way back to Shakespeare. So if you don't have any topics for your upcoming English essay, um, I do implore you to uh, do some research here. Shakespeare. <laughs> if you have an oral essay on Shakespeare, um, then wink, wink, nudge, nudge, this is your time uh, to choose a topic that was most suited to the 16th century. But it wasn't just the great English bard who was busy writing about the joys of this culinary delight. We have mentions throughout a range of literature, poetry, and as we begin to experiment and kind of develop the genre of the novel in country matters. There's this beautiful um, small poem that has an anonymous 
author that is called a fragment to Lin, which is called a fragment to Linda, and it's a bit more risque than you know some of Shakespeare's love sonnets tend to be. Soft, you suck my breath away. Drink the life drops of my heart. Draw my soul from every part. Scarce my senses can sustain so much pleasure, so much pain. I love that this like depiction of oral sex has also just incorporated a little bit of sadomasochism. Um, they were doing it dirty back in Shakespeare's time, girl, so don't feel any shame about it today. Now, of course, it wasn't just in literature that we see depictions of oral sex in the early Middle Ages. We also see plenty of illustrations across art from the period. Fruit and vegetables, for example, were frequently used as metaphors for sex in the Renaissance and in Baroque art. Some that you probably missed when you went to the Vatican was copious depictions and suggestions of oral sex. In fact, in one of Raphael, not the turtle, uh, one of his paintings of Cupid and Psyche that we can find in Rome, we can see a border over plants and fruits, um, and we can see numerous phallic-shaped foods throughout the picture. Now, many of these are found with people who are reaching out to grab the fruit and vegetable and to put it in their mouth. This was a very clear, if euphemistic, depiction of oral sex. Um, And it can be quite shocking for some people to know that even in the Vatican, there is a secret pornography room where a range of these kind of oral kind of linkus activities are depicted. Um, You actually need special clearance to be able to get into this room and no pictures are allowed to be taken uh, because it used to be in the bedchambers of the papal um, apartments. Do with that information as you will. But while these can seem quite uh, erotic and kinky and pornographic, they are generally considered to have been put into these paintings as a warning against oral sex. Take that interpretation with a pinch of salt. Um, Apparently in depicting the sinful people wanting to engage in oral sex, it was a way to deter people from this kind of behavior because it was only the sinful and degenerate in this period of time that was seen to want to participate in a little licky licky downstairs. Um, Witches, for instance, along with their practice of rimming, were known to engage in oral sex and kind of lingus mainly with one another, because as we know, all witches and sinful people are women, naughty women. Now coming into like the Italian Renaissance, uh, I want to talk about Pietro Arantino, who is considered the forefather of literary pornography. This man wrote some truly filthy stuff. But why I want to talk about him today um, is that Arantino very much called out the church for what he perceived as being very hypocritical. Now, this is because of the very euphemistic depictions of oral sex that were commissioned in their art, and also because in some 16th century uh, festivals, uh, people would eat phallic-shaped foods uh, for a bit of a laugh and part of the kind of custom, which was very suggestive of oral sex and obviously meant to be making fun of the sinners who engaged in this. Arantino was having absolutely none of it. So Arantino basically called the church out and said, you can't keep condemning oral sex when you find it funny to eat phallic shaped objects and depict it in your art. He basically, in layman's terms, said, you don't actually hate this, you love it and admit it. Arantino, absolute boss, we will do an episode on him. So following the kind of inspiration of Pietro Arantino, who says, call a spade a spade, depict oral sex and admit you love it, um, many authors began to depict oral sex in their writing. This must be one of my, uh, actually, what year was this? Okay, this may be one of my favorite references to uh, fellatio that comes from the 17th century. And it was in a book called The School of Venus uh, by Nicolas Gautier. Now, at one part in this book, um, a husband is very much convincing his new wife uh, that he should perform oral sex on him um, and that it isn't a sin because, as he says, 
what matter whether you fulfill your <laughs> sorry what matter whether you fulfill your marital duty through that pure canal or through that other which is more in fact and she responds to her first introduction into the world of performing fellatio let's remember they didn't have wiki how at that time so they didn't know how to do this and um, by making this absolutely beautiful statement oh what an air you want me to play and upon what a flute in our concert taking in her hand his member which began to rise she sees the point of his dart between her lips and turning her tongue around it caused novel transports of delight to the member that slid into its new receptacle but feeling that the fountains of the brine of venus were on the point of bursting forth she recoiled in horror you would not degrade me so far she said, as to drink man in liquid form. Man in liquid form is the only way I will now be responding to semen. Now, no mention of the history of oral sex would truly be complete if we did not turn to potentially the most infamous and notorious pornographic writer of all time, the Marquis de Sade. Now, the Marquis is writing at the end of the 18th century, and he manages to write some of the most confronting and explicit depictions of Carnalingus that I think we have even today. Um, this man was so wildly horny with such a violent imagination that some of his depictions still continue to be shocking in our age of the internet. <laughs> this one comes from a book known as 120 Days of Sodom. He had stretched me out naked upon the bed, stretched out himself, his head to my toe, and popped his prick into my mouth, his tongue in my cunt, and, having adopted this attitude, bade me return for voluptuous titillations, he declared his tongue was very certainly going to be cure for me. I sucked as best as I could, and he to my tutelage, he licked, he bubbled, he splashed about, and without a doubt in all of these manoeuvres laboured infinitely more in his own behalf than in mine this is a beautiful illustration of the 69 position happening in the 18th century and um, for folks who maybe don't know what the 69 position is that is when two people strategically position themselves one below the other and turn themselves around so both of their genitals are placed within one another's mouth. And yes, this was practiced all the way back in the 1700s. They then finish by wriggling the juice from his prick within my lips by swishing it about in my mouth. Classic literature. Beautiful. <laughs> Whenever people say, like, you know, I wish we were more conservative, like we were, you know, back in the times of the, like Jane Austen and everything, I just kind of want them to read this paragraph. No, we have always been filthy. So as we can very clearly see, we have always had a relationship to oral sex. And in some cases, it was practiced and more acceptable than engaging in penetrative sex. You know, especially coming towards the 1960s where we see this kind of sexual revolution and greater sexual freedom and openness, oral sex kind of makes a comeback in being one of those sexual acts that really has no other purpose than celebrating the joys of pleasure and giving and receiving pleasure with another party. And also it's, you know, quite a vulnerable act in a lot of ways. Uh, having someone's eyes directly in your genitals is definitely not an activity for the shy person. I always think that oral sex is something that kind of takes almost a lot more trust and deep connection in some cases than penetrative sex. Um, because having someone's genitals inside your mouth is not always a very... <laughs> delicious experience um so i think there is something weirdly beautiful in allowing yourself to be that gross and vulnerable with another human maybe that's my own experiences and teaching from wiki how uh but here we are now today with oral sex back on the rise again we can kind of see how it's been deeply rooted in a very long history 
At times we see it as something incredibly shameful that could get you months and months of penance. At others, being good at oral sex could get your... (laughs) At others, being good at oral sex could literally bring your husband back to life. But whichever way we want to look at it, we can see that our joys and enjoyment of culinary delights have a long history and are in no fear of going anywhere anytime soon. Thank you so much for joining the podcast today. I have been your host, Esme Louise James, and thank you so much for joining me here at Kinky History. And if you can't get enough, then you can find me across socials on TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube. Or if you love me that much, you can come and join our kinky history community found on Sunroom. This will get you lots of extra content, uh, direct messages to myself where you can ask questions and even ask for personalized lessons. What's not to love?